Hi, I'm Jeremy. And hi, I'm Damien. Welcome to our first ever Suburb Data podcast. If you're new here, we share our experiences so you can have the confidence in making informed decisions. So let's begin with a proper introduction, Jeremy. Who exactly are we and how did we meet? (laughs) Well, uh, who am I? I'm a property investor. And I guess I got stuck into property investing and ended up building uh, an algorithm, the demand to supply ratio. And there was a website that was built, dsrdata.com.au, and that's sort of how we met. Uh, well, it was uh, technically it was on the plane, wasn't it, on our way from Sydney to Melbourne? It was, yes. So it was um, the first time I reached out to you was via the support desk on dsrdata.com because I wanted to save my criteria um, and unfortunately <laughs> that we couldn't do that but I love the fact that you responded to me within 24 hours. I was a bit like a, a fanboy at the time. Um, I was yeah. very excited. I'm like Jeremy's actually reaching out to me but it was on that plane that we sat down next to each other and realised that I realised who you were and I'm um, a bit nervous at the start but we <laughs> built a, a good friendship. Yeah, I can, remember, uh, I can remember a Damien uh, asking for that feature and, and it's a feature that I've wanted as well. We still don't have that feature, by the way, <laughs> but we will for suburbdata.com.au. Uh, anyway, that's, that's how we met. But you were obviously a property investor in order to use the website. Exactly, yes. Yeah. So around um, 2015, I think it was around the time I, I reached mm. out to you and um, I was doing my own research at that time, I feel like Sydney was going through a boom. Um, and yeah, I just loved everything about data, you know, all the books that I could read, um, seminars I could go to, just couldn't get enough of it. And I came across one of the podcasts that you were on and I um, I loved it. I loved the way that you were, you know, direct, straight and just looking at analytics than just talking fluff, really, <laughs> <laughs> um, which is I feel like I hear a lot of that within the industry at the moment. Um, yeah, yeah, there is a fair bit of, uh, of fluff. Hopefully we can cut through that. Um, yeah. All right, so um, your property investing journey, um, yeah. you want to start? Uh, yeah, so I'll, yeah, so I started, it actually was in, back in 2009, so uh, wasn't sure what I really wanted to do, was quite confused, um, and I was studying at Wollongong University and I realised that I wanted to, well, my mum actually wanted me to buy a property And it was in Arundel, Queensland, in a gated estate. And my reasoning behind the purchase was the real estate agents mentioned that the area is going to increase in value due to the Commonwealth Games. Um, Ah. So I purchased that property and around, what, maybe 10 years later, I ended up selling that and barely had any growth, maybe paid around $330 for it and sold it for $370. So Mm. I think cost me a lot in opportunity cost, but even the expenses were through the roof, just yeah. through the the body corp um, that was there and the on-site manager. But that was my initial introduction to property. And when I realized that you know Sydney was going through a boom, I'm thinking, why isn't my property growing? And I needed to know why it wasn't growing in value. These real estate agents are telling me, oh, it's gonna go up, don't worry, hold it, hold it. Everyone says hold. Yeah. Um, and then sometimes you need to make that hard decision where you need to sell. But then I was looking at my second investment and that's when I came across the DSR data at the time. Um, and yeah, that's really you know where my journey came along. And then I, I joined a buyer's agent firm um, as a property investment advisor and was there for over seven years, gained a lot of experience, you know, dealing with mortgage brokers, financial planners, buyer's agents, you know, doing over 500 plans, well laid out plans for clients, helping with money management. Um, and I've got a big desire in helping people. And the best thing about it was we worked together. So that was just a great opportunity for us to always have our chats, discussions, and just see what was happening in the industry. And we, you know, I just really loved um, having those discussions with you. Yeah. Do you, do you remember that I used to say, Damien, the first step to become to, to go from a novice property investor to an expert, the, what's the first thing you got to do? You got to write a book on property investing. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I've read a and, lot of those books. Yeah, and that changed to now you've got to host a podcast. Well, 
yeah, here we are. Yeah, and there's a lot of content. We we hope to we can bring a lot of value to to all our listeners. And um, so that's a bit about my journey. But how about your property investment yeah. journey? How did it start? Yeah, mine was mine was a really dismal start. Um, I had the the classic nightmare tenant. Uh, didn't pay any rent. Um, damaged the property on departure. Um, but even then, I, I don't know where the optimism came from. But I I can remember uh, once they were out, just feeling very positive about about property investing mm. and and I invited some um, local agents in the area to give me a, an estimate of what, what they thought the property was was worth a year after I'd purchased it and I'd happened to start my uh, journey in property investing at just the right time when Sydney was going through a boom and so I was yeah really confident I thought oh this works this is fantastic and I bought another one and and I kept uh, aggressively purchasing over the years um, I bought 16 investment properties across a couple of different countries over different states all within about seven years i was very aggressive had some rather creative financing <laughs> techniques uh and if that all sort of came undone when the gfc hit yeah. but but through all of those mistakes um i think it gave birth to what is important in property investing and it really is capital growth it's the ants pants of property investing and when I started thinking, well, how can I maximise capital growth? That's what gave birth to the demand to supply ratio uh, and this, this whole data-driven approach to investing rather than what I was doing before, which was, which was pretty much guesswork. Yeah. I guess back to the, what you mentioned about it's all about capital growth. Do you find there's a bit of a balance there? You can still target these areas with good yield, oh, good yeah, cash flow, yeah, yeah. but also that opportunity for growth because – you know, you've got you know some firms out there that will just focus on Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, mm. Adelaide, maybe just targeting high growth and maybe those sort of lower yields. Um, but sometimes you need those yields if you know the cash flows aren't there for people yeah, to fund right. their lifestyles. And and you have a look at some of these regional areas, and they're they're fine over the long term. There's no reason to believe that you have to invest in Sydney and Melbourne to get long term capital growth. Um, the analysis of the data over the last 30 plus years has shown that regional markets will perform uh, just as well as uh, as the big guns. And I guess starting out, did you have, I see a lot of people struggle with this, like did you have a well laid out plan? <laughs> like was there any guidance? Because that's the biggest challenge in the industry, yeah. like where are you heading? Yeah, I had I had no, no plan. Uh, it was really just a case of I hope this works and uh, – and I guess that first investment property, the f well, initially, once I got rid of that tenant, I thought, yeah, this is now working. But what I discovered uh, over, over coming years, you know, you, you learn as you go. But there's so much resources available now for investors to make, uh, to start, um, you know, hitting the ground running. Mm. Uh, for me, it was a case of, oh, yeah, I, le I learned from books. I did, did webinars and seminars and things like that. But I still feel like I didn't. I didn't have enough information because there's so much BS that's that's published out there, and it takes a long time of making the wrong mistakes before you can wade through all that and uh, and and figure out what what really does work. And, and as you know, with me, it took me a while to um, to figure that out. I was a big fan of you know reading all the books, um, the podcasts, the the seminars. You know, they pick out someone from the crowd. You know. That gives a review, and I was just—I <laughs> was sort of sucked into a lot of that at the time. Um, but luckily, I didn't go ahead. I had a bit of that analysis paralysis, and that sort of was my biggest hurdle, I think, um, mm -hmm. as a as an investor early on. But through my experience as an advisor and dealing with clients day in, day out, you know, seeing couples come in, single people, and really, it just comes down to understanding the lifestyle that you want to have before you're even thinking about buying an investment property. So having your buffers in place um, and just understanding what's your income, what's your expenses, what surplus have you got available to inject into that property. So it could be a property at 830,000 or it could be a property at 670,000. Maybe you split it up into two to diversify the risk. So mm. um, yeah, like in our future podcast, we'll be talking and discussing a lot about that. So did you face any big hurdles in your Journey. Oh, hurdles are plenty at pr pretty much every property. I mean, there was the nightmare tenant. There was insurers who didn't want to uh, pay premiums. Um, 
There was the whole creative finance thing. If you have picked the absolute best lender where no one else will deal with you, they can, they can set their interest rates wherever they like. They've got you over a barrel. Uh, so that's, that's another lesson I've learned. Um, you can research the area all you like, but if you haven't researched the, the, the tenant or the property manager, there's another mistake you can make. Um, I, I am wondering what the next big mistake is that I'm going to make, but um, yeah, I'm hoping I've made all of the big ones up front. Yeah. Uh, they've been quite costly. Um, trusting trusting uh, so-called experts mm. uh, or experts at promoting themselves as experts but not actually experts at property investing. Um, so I've, I've been sucked into that. Um, so I think I've, I've gone from being fairly gullible to – very sceptical and that has served me well. Now the scepticism has served me well. Do, do you believe some of the, the so-called experts believe that they're doing the right thing by their clients? Yeah, I think most people are well-meaning. It's just it's human nature. You'll always find in any large enough sample of, of human beings, you'll find good and bad amongst them. And I think the good outweigh the bad. And I think most are well-meaning, but they're just they're just misinformed. They they haven't educated themselves or they've swallowed, like I did, um, you know, the wrong sort of education. What, what was the first challenge that you had? I think, was it your first property with a property manager? Uh, no, the, the first, the, the property manager I got for my first property, who is still my property manager, they were excellent and they took on a really tough role. I made the mistake of, of self-managing uh, a nightmare tenant mm. and they, they agreed uh, to, to take on that, that job and evict that tenant so that they would have my business with the next tenant. And, uh, yeah, think, since then it's been a, a wonderful relationship. But, um, yeah, to begin with, th th they were, yeah, probably not the worst experience I've had, honestly. Uh, things got worse after that. <laughs> <laughs> but you had, a, you had a property, though, that the property manager or the tenants were a nightmare. But the, oh, property, you're did, thinking of, the property did really well, though, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, New Zealand. So I, I had... Um, the property manager knew the tenants and oh, were holding back on telling me about the state of disrepair that this property was getting into. And when the, the property manager left that, that uh, firm and was replaced with a new property manager, they, the first thing they did was contact me and say, oh, Jeremy, I've gone to inspect your property. It is, it is shocking. I'm re really sorry to inform you that, it's, that there's a lot of work that needs to be done and the property manager has shafted you. But that whole area was having such tremendous capital growth that it sort of masked the, the issue with, with cash flow and the, and the state of the property. So, again, highlighting just how important it is to have good capital growth. Yeah, and I think my biggest hurdle was which area to invest in. Like uh, coming from an accounting background, I did accounting and finance at university and I was just all about numbers, numbers. Mm. And it's like, well, how do I know that maybe I should be buying in the Sutherland Shire or maybe I should be going to Brisbane or maybe I should go to Perth. Like it was just like, how do I know? I just didn't want to make that mistake. But what I've seen over my time and in my experience with looking at numbers and data is, you know, you shortlist your suburbs through the DSR, which we'll get to shortly, um, Shortlist the suburbs, making sure that you've got your buffers in place. And then once you've got those shortlists of suburbs, start honing in on that actual asset. So suburb selection first, then down to that, that asset selection. Mm. Um, hey, you know how, okay, you've, you've done like literally hundreds of plans yes. for people who might be like truck drivers, pilots, surgeons, celebrities and so on. You know how there's all this talk about um, higher income areas mm. are safer and historically the data suggests that's, that's not so much the case. Mm. Have you noticed that, that higher income brings with it higher expense? Like do, do uh, higher income earners have bigger buffers than lower income earners? Uh, very good question. I've seen it pretty much all of it. I've seen massive household incomes but their expenses also follow the more that they earn and, you know, they'd come to us and we would guide them and, you know, it was easy for us because they wanted to make a change. They wanted to, um, you know, invest in property. So for them, it, it was mixed. You know, I've seen two accountants, you know, um, husband and wife, and they didn't know how to manage their money and they were both CPA, mm. they were chartered accountants. Right. So um, you specialise in a certain sector, so you can be an accountant, but you might specialise in management accountant or tax accounting. Oh, I see. Yeah. 
Um, with us, and that was the beauty of my job, was I was able to see everything. I could see, did they have their insurances in place with a financial planner? Did they have interest only on their investment debt through their broker? So I was able to liaise with all these experts and it, I just gained a lot of experience over time. But with the income, um, everyone's different. Yeah. And you learn. Yeah. And But you have to – I figured you also need to enjoy your life. Like I've dealt with people where they were just penny pinching just everything. They wouldn't go on their holidays, do the things that they love – because I'll really aggressive. I'm like, enjoy your life. Have your buffers. <laughs> do the things that you want to do. You need yeah. to be happy. Yeah, good advice. Good advice. Um, so maybe could you maybe shed a bit of light on the creation of DSR data and the driving force behind it? Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I always try and think back to the time when, when I had the idea of the DSR and I just cannot remember. But I can remember looking at data. They, data was published in the back of magazines Um Back in those days, uh, there are no magazines in print at the moment, but uh, I used to look at the data and there's really only a handful of metrics there and think to myself, I wonder, what, how do I interpret this metric? What does that mean exactly? Um, and I, d I don't know when it happened, but the penny dropped. Capital growth happens when demand exceeds supply. How can I measure demand? How can I measure supply? And because I was working in IT at that time, I, I could use my skills to acquire these sorts of metrics, this data, Australia-wide, and I came up with the idea of the, the which I later called the demand to supply ratio. Uh, and it, what I wanted to do was have a single score for every suburb around Australia that was calculated yeah. in the same way so that I could compare apples with apples. And uh, I remember in January 2010, I'd acquired all this data from around Australia and calculated my first DSRs and I contacted real estate agents in Airlie Beach because it was one of the worst locations. <laughs> I wanted to know what they were going to say. And they they treated me like royalty. It was, it was amazing. They returned all my calls. They were happy to chat. They wanted me to fly up there. They'd show me around. Contrast that with the best suburb at the time, which happened to be Heathcote, houses in Heathcote. And... I think there was only one real estate agent that responded uh, by way of email and they said, yeah, Jeremy, we'll put you on the list. We'll notify you as soon as anything becomes available. <laughs> so, so I had an idea then. Uh, I think this thing works. Okay. And I guess the, the DSR score though, so there's two. We've got the basic DSR yeah, and the DSR one. plus score. So the first one's got, is it eight variables, the DSR yeah, score? Yeah, so th when I first started, there were there were a measly eight variables in version one. Mm. And uh, although it, it still works, uh, it works okay. Uh, but in uh, late 2014, I came up with some ideas uh, for version two, which I later called DSR Plus. So it has all the same metrics as version one, plus uh, an additional nine metrics to make 17. And uh, we've been working pretty hard uh, with with Luke Metcalf of Microburbs mm -hmm. to come up with, who's an absolute ace data scientist, to come up with version three, which I uh, can't wait to to get out there. And I'm hopefully going to be the first one to use it to, to buy my next investment property. <laughs> I know you're excited. I'm excited. <laughs> We're all excited for it. So hopefully not far away for everyone. Um, and I guess mm. do you have a background in data science at no, all or no, no. nothing? I, I, I know enough about data science to get myself in some serious trouble. I've played around with Python. I've done some online courses, but whenever it's something serious, um, yeah, I outsource it and uh, yeah, no one better than Luke to, to have a look at that. Yeah, great. And I guess um, how does the data play a role in, I guess, your decision-making process when you're buying a property? Well, it's, it's really suburb selection. Um, there isn't anything we, we use at the moment to select an individual asset, but once you have selected the right area, uh, you are in, in pretty good shape. So uh, I, I just use it for that, for, for suburb selection. So I use it to shortlist and, uh, yeah, go from there. I do uh, – I have in the past done a little bit more fundamental research. I think we're getting closer and closer to the point where we have to trust almost implicitly what the algorithm says – uh, there's very little research that I will do once DSR version 3 is released uh, because I want to be very careful that I don't undo uh, the, the, int the intelligence of the algorithm. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I've made that mistake in the past. And I think it was great doing some consulting work with you maybe, what, two months ago for a couple? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, they had a budget of around a million dollars and we sort of looked at some, uh, shortlisted about four different LGAs for them, which was a, great. So it gives them some options, you know, even breaking it down from the land size also, like average block size that we had. Um, so it gives power back to to clients. Yeah, yeah, it is very powerful. Yeah, and it's look, the DSR – a subscription-based service, it gives access to data. So who does it actually suit, the DSR data? Well, it's it's the investor, the property investor, obviously, uh, but also professionals who serve those investors like buyers, agents, uh, property managers, real estate agents, um, valuers. Uh, but I, I see the most amount of benefit uh, to, to buyers, agents who want that data-driven approach to serve their clients and, of course, personal investors. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's it's really uh, answering that question, where should I buy? And, look, I've used it on a daily basis nearly almost for the last seven years, <laughs> especially um, back in the days of advising. And, like, I see a lot of clients come through with a property portfolio. And the thing I love doing most was assessing – their current portfolio, looking at how it's performed, is it beating the national average? Because you hear it a lot out there, just hold a property, mm. never sell. But you've got to do some consulting and understand you might need to let that asset go um, and purchase somewhere else because it's that yeah. opportunity cost that can really hurt you in the long term. It just I don't understand when people for 10 years held a property, it's either gone backwards or it hasn't, you know, just or plateaued. And they still want to yeah, keep yeah, that property. I've made some of those terrible mistakes. I've had to let go of some of those properties. But I guess the it depends on your attitude when you've made that mistake. Mm. Well, this is a very expensive learning experience. And then you you like I pride myself on never making the same mistake more than half a dozen times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I agree. I agree with you. <laughs> you learn from your mistakes, yeah, don't you? Yeah, you learn from your mistakes. I've learned it with shares. I've learned it with crypto. I've tried it all. But um, property investing has just kept that. I'm happy I had more of that asset allocation to property. Yeah, one of the issues with making mistakes in property investing is it's it's a big mistake. Big. I mean, I've I've measured a, a, an opportunity cost close to a million dollars where I made a mistake <laughs> investing somewhere. And yeah, it has cost me close to a million dollars. That's... Yeah, one very simple mistake to make. Uh, so you can't afford to make too many mistakes in property investing unless you start very early. But I guess holding long term, eventually time does become your friend. Yeah. But ideally you want to get in the right markets at the right time. Yeah, because I guess you have a lot of your asset allocation all into property so it's not diversified. So if you put all your eggs in one basket, you're trying to build up that deposit, your liquidity, your cash is pretty much – depleted Tied where up, with shares yeah. crypto you can access that money quite quickly but they're obviously very volatile so i'm a big fan of asset allocation which we'll talk about in our later episodes uh, but i guess like another question reflecting back dsr you've launched it i'm guessing people would have been risk averse they haven't heard of this before how do they know that it works and oh, yeah. i believe skepticism should always <clears throat> be there um, until you do your due diligence so how did you um Gain confidence of people. Yeah, it was really tough actually. Back in, I mean, we're talking 2010. I mean, this whole chat GPT thing is really recent. Uh, people's approach when you say, hey, I've got an algorithm was, yeah, immediate scepticism. Oh, you've got an algorithm, do you? Yeah, I, I don't trust that. I'd rather just walk around a suburb and get a feel for it. That's, mm. that's going to give me a better idea. And uh, it, it didn't help that there were... Uh, there was one other algorithm I remember in 2008, even before I started, and uh, it was actually put out by by Domain. And they, um, Australian Property Investor Magazine, used to publish a, a Hot 100, and they consulted with Domain. Give us give us your top picks, along with the, some other experts of the day, and uh, it it performed so poorly. There was daylight between it and second last when we were reviewing, you know, a year later and you never heard from them again. And this is always in the mind of investors, you know, it's, mm. it's lies, damn lies and statistics. So it has taken a long time for people to eventually realise just how well this works. And, and fair enough too, you want to see a track record, a past performance that shows that it does work. So 
I've I've looked at the past performance of the GSR. It's not perfect, but it certainly has outperformed a lot of the industry experts of of the same day. Yeah, I think the biggest challenge I guess I see in the industry, which we'll touch on, is um, like you might go to a buyer's agent firm, but they're uh, specific to one area. It could just be Sydney, or it could just be Brisbane. So if you go to them, they're going to say just buy in Brisbane. Mm. You know, what you want is a pure, a pure borderless buyer's agent that will go to anywhere. It could be Tasmania, it could be Perth, it could be Adelaide, depending on the market um, and it's sort of timing it a little bit, I think, yeah, is, is yeah. really important. And that's that's the thing that this sort of algorithm makes so easy because you are getting a, a view of all of Australia. You can scan all of Australia within, within seconds for a particular uh, buyer's brief, you know, between 400, 500,000, for example. And the great thing is with Market Matcher, you can break down certain statistics. So like you go, okay, I want a yield of 5.5% as mm -hmm. a minimum. I need a DSR plus score of 60 plus. Um, so that's the beauty of, of the tool yeah, and yeah. the algorithm. Yeah, it, it makes it Australia-wide too. makes it easy to be a borderless investor. Yeah, and how would you describe your research philosophy? Well, it's straight up and down data-driven. Um, yeah, I don't – it's very hard, you know, to filter out your own bias – and you don't know how far it, it reaches. So I do more, more nowadays than ever rely on the data. Even when I first created the DSR in 2010, I was using it merely as a shortlisting tool. And then I would go and have a look at these suburbs that it was picking out and, and I don't even know what I was looking at back then, but I would filter, I'd scratch some from the list. Nowadays, uh, I am far more cautious to do that and I'm a lot more trusting of the algorithm and certainly with GSR version 3, um, I, I'm, I'm loath to, to, to filter myself. And the thing is no one can predict long-term capital growth, really. Like Long-term? Yeah, yeah, very because, difficult. Yeah, anyone can say long-term but really the DSR, the DSR algorithm version 3 is all about um, trying to get into those markets where you can, you know, supply is limited but you're going to get that higher probability of growth a lot sooner so you can go again to maybe buy that second investment or that mm. third investment and be able to, you know, access that equity. Yeah, and I mean, if it doesn't work out for you with your short term, you just hold. And like I've said before, time covers over a, a multitude of ineptitude at picking the right growth market. <laughs> Build up those offset accounts and, you know, and enjoy life a little bit too along the way. Yeah. Um, and I guess, like, what's your perspective on other property data companies in the industry because so I'm seeing more and more pop up, which is great, but you know, how does DSR stand out? Yeah, well, I have done some comparison of the DSR versus some of the higher profile industry experts and, uh, yeah, it, it, it has, without mentioning any names, it would embarrass them if they, if they were to have a look at their past performance. Um, but I, I think by and large there's, I think the, the majority of like we're talking buyers agents here. I think there's there's a there's an old school and a new school, and I do like how the new school are embracing data, mm. and some of the old school too. Um, but yeah, from from my perspective, I think that this data age is going to brush aside the old school who just who have used uh, equivalent to to tea leaf reading type guesswork <laughs> of or tarot card reading, <laughs> you know, they, they get out their divining rod and, and eeny, meeny, miny, mo. And uh, obviously you would expect them to just match the performance of the national growth rate because it is so random. Uh, we are getting to a point where we can easily outperform the national growth rate. And it's one of the things that make makes property investing so much more appealing to share investing. You try and outperform the ASX 200, for example, you are competing against fund managers, um, expert institutional investors. But when you buy an investment property, first of all, you, you could be just buying from not another investor, but uh, an owner occupier who isn't even thinking from financial perspective. And secondly, you've got access to this, this new data, this, this data age uh, to easily outperform the index. And I just think that that's, um, that's making property investing even more attractive. Yeah, and I guess with the visual, the new website suburbdata.com.au, you know we're building the new algorithm DSR version three. Um, why? Like why are we? What, <laughs> why are we building it? Well, I, my my goal is to have uh, the ultimate research platform. 
that anyone can use to, to have a data-driven, astute approach to making well-informed deci decisions in property investing. So moving away from the guesswork, having some evidence-based research and a tool that allows you to do that. So, yeah, making that available to everyone. And I agree. I want there to be more data. As you know, I love data. I love the numbers and I just want more <laughs> More like even, you know, I was hassling you about um, the infill risk. You know, I want to, I want those ah, statistics yes. for every suburb in LGA. I want to know the average block sizes for every suburb. So when I'm doing my analysis, I can break that down. Um, so it's going to be really exciting. And I think the industry is going to be blown away. Um, yeah, well, I hope so. I hope we can we can provide exactly that to, to investors. Yeah. yeah. And I guess, do you see any, um, or what gaps do you see in the current, you know, the property industry? Well, I think there's... We're starting to see a, a big divergence between the data-driven investors and, mm. and professionals versus the, I don't know, they probably call themselves, uh, you know, fundamentals. Um, I see them as, as, as just old school and I really do think this data age is, is going to brush them aside uh, unless they can embrace the data. So I think that, that there is that gap uh, in the industry about data-driven versus Mm, what 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 do I diplomatically call it? I'll call it fundamental research. Yeah, and I think the the thing I've seen, I guess, from advice and buyers, agents, firms out there, not that this should never be rushed. You know, there shouldn't be any yeah. incentives to get you know plans out or any incentives just to get buyers, agents to purchase more properties. It needs to put the clients first and make sure that they're they're doing the right thing and not charging um, quite a lot of money. Um, and you know, you need to keep the experts or, you know, these firms accountable? Like, and, you know, are they beating the national average? Like, that's the first question you should be asking is, yeah. I bought a property through a buyer's agent firm. How has it performed? Okay, give it a little bit of time, but you think within a, what, two to three year period, they're at least beating that national average. You'd hope so for the yeah. fee that you're yeah, paying. you would hope so, yeah. Otherwise, right. get the map out, get the dart <laughs> and have a throw. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, well, in future episodes, uh, we'll explore some of these uh, these myths, these uh Misnomers. This, we'll go through that expert. I'm going to get series. the map out and throw the dart <laughs> and see if the DSR can can beat it. Okay, how's that sound? So yeah. let's discuss the expert busting series and what it's all about. I know you've spoken a lot about yeah. it, and I'm I'm really excited to to bring the content to our channel and our podcast. But yeah, maybe I'd yeah. Like to so hear more about so it. over the years, I've heard uh, a lot of content marketing, uh, for want of a better word. Uh, it's it's really Supposed insights packaged up uh, as insights, but it's really just um, debatable truths. And I have um, examined, for example, topics like uh, population growth, proximity to CBD. Mm. Should I be buying in suburbs with high income or high income growth or high income relative to the state average? Uh, and there's, there's more than 30 topics that I've uh, researched, analysed using historical data to see is it important to, to buy near a train station? Should your suburb be a beachside suburb or have a, have a good shopping centre or all those sorts of things? And uh, it dispels a lot of these myths in the industry and a lot of it seems to be counterintuitive, but this is, this is what the data says. This is the truth. And so that expert busting series uh, will tread on a few toes it will, there will be some awkward moments there. <laughs> uh, but the whole aim is I'm an investor. I need to use this data to improve my investing and we want to improve the algorithm and make it better for professionals and investors to use. So if the data is telling us this is nonsense, this doesn't work, it does not go in the algorithm. Yeah, we look at the data and we welcome, you know, any challenge from anyone out there. Like we're open to everything. Um and let the data do the do talking. Do the talking, that's yeah, right. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I'm open to someone saying, look, Jeremy, I've analysed some data and I disagree with you. That's fine. Let's have a look at that data. But, but what I don't want to hear is yet another opinion. Um, I think it was Hi Hippocrates who, who, who said, I mean, we're going back centuries now, but he said something along the lines of uh, science uh, gives birth to, to knowledge, opinions give birth to ignorance yeah. and I opinions are in oversupply. I know that income growth is a big one for you. You've mentioned it a lot of times and I've heard it a lot and I agree with you. I don't want to hear someone just say, oh, this area is growing just because the income's there. 
Mm. Not saying it's their opinion, it's that the, the way that it is. So I'm really looking forward to that. And um, I guess how do you react with, you know, real estate agents when they claim an area is going to consistently outperform like with the train station or with the school or mm. with the – Yeah, yeah well, a lot be. of them are just shooting from the hip. They don't really know. They haven't analysed anything. Some of it can be just uh, marketing BS uh, yeah. or some of it could be some some misinformation that they've absorbed over the years uh, from someone else who has, who has BSed them. Uh, there is no correlation to that sort of – to amenities and long-term capital growth. Um, but we'll cover that in more more detail in our expert busting series. But there are yeah heaps of those sort of topics. Can't wait. And I guess who wins the capital growth rate race? So for example, it's Sydney, Melbourne, yeah, Tasmania, yeah, good topic. Brisbane. Like, who wins? Yeah, you don't need to be a big gun. You don't need to be uh, an investor in Sydney or Melbourne. Regional markets are just as attractive over the long term. And timing's got a little bit to do with it. You know, sometimes I say just buy and hold, but you, you want to try and pick it on the uplift. See those yeah, DSR yeah. scores really picking up and try and get into that on the upswing. Yeah, well, it's always been said uh, location, location, location. But uh, I believe that the data age is going to turn that around to timing, timing, timing. Okay, and what can our viewers expect from our channel moving forward our podcast yeah loads of those expert busting series topics um yeah. data insights all aimed at helping investors make informed uh, objective data-driven decisions yeah and i'm looking forward to that and then um i guess what's a valuable tip for a first-time investor uh i would say be skeptical of everyone and everything just challenge everything and uh I think that I think that's um, you will avoid a lot of the obvious spruikers, but it'll be difficult to avoid some of the misinformation that's there. But it's a good start. Be yeah. skeptical. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think another valuable tip for me is just get your money management in order. Oh, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, understand where you're heading. Is there anything big coming up? Are you planning on taking time off work, traveling for a year, starting a family, um, whatever it might be? You know. Money in, money out, what's left over, and just automate your finances. It just makes life so much easier. Um, yeah, this is going to be awesome, this, yeah. this series. Yeah. So, look, thanks thanks for your time, Jeremy. Thanks for listening, everyone. Um, stay updated with our property insights and content. Uh, you know what to do. We'll see you in our next episode.